There we go. Today's passage, right, is going to be from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in the town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So he came, she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Then Jesus answered to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? So Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you just now. We want to ask you that you would open our hearts to your word. Lord, let us find out more about this event that happened in this narrative this morning, Lord. Would you be with us through your Holy Spirit? Would you help us receive straight as from you? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this week, we're looking at Jesus being invited to the meal um, in the Gospel of Luke by someone called Simon, who was also a Pharisee. And this passage comes after Jesus said to the crowds in Luke, you guys like complaining a lot. You're forever moaning about everything. You didn't like John the Baptist because he was weird. He didn't eat bread. He didn't drink wine. Uh, you don't like me because I eat and drink with the sinners. You call me a glutton and a drunkard. What would ever make you guys happy? And then out of nowhere, out of all people, a Pharisee invites Jesus to eat at the um, meal or feast or banquet that he has prepared. Um, and I'm saying banquet because others were invited as well, not just Jesus. But I guess none of us will ever know, as it's not in the Bible, um, some of the questions that we might have, you know, why the Pharisee invited Jesus. Or, you know, maybe the Pharisee invited him just to test him as his reputation was um, spreading that he's a prophet of God, or maybe not, maybe he was a secret fan, we never know. And so we're in the Gospel of Luke today, and this wonderful story that people sometimes compare, but is not to be confused with the ones found in the other three Gospels when Jesus was anointed. I'm sure the writing is quite small there, so most of you won't be able to see it, but if you want the slide, you can have it afterwards. Uh, but we've got some of the differences between the Gospels up there. Um, and one of the questions that people have asked throughout time about these different four passages are, you know, is this Mary, um, as in Martha and Mary, um, the same Mary as Mary Magdalene? Or is the unnamed woman uh, or the woman that was a sinner either Mary or Mary Magdalene? Again, there's not enough evidence to prove any of this uh, because it's not in the Bible. And apparently there were plenty of talks about this passage as well in Luke, and a lot of people kept saying that, Luke didn't really know what he was talking about, as his story doesn't coincide with the rest, but it's simply that it's not the same story. Now, you've got two stories which are the same, 
um, one in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26, and the same in the Gospel of Mark chapter 14, where a woman comes um, over at Simon the leper's house, um, a woman that is not called a sinner, which poured expensive perfume on Jesus' head, and then some complained about the waste. Then you have second story, which is in John's Gospel in chapter 12, um, which is very similar, uh, could have been the same story, but in this one, Mary, as in Mary um, and Martha from the Lazarus resurrection story, that Mary uh, poured expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. Then she wiped his feet with her hair, and then Judas Iscariot complained of waste and loss of money. Now, in all of those three stories, Jesus says to the people there, um, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And so the focus of the stories leads us to um, a different path where Jesus tells them to focus on what's more important now and leave the woman alone, focus on him, learn from him as much as they could because he was there for a short amount of time and then they could you know, have enough time afterwards to focus on the poor and social action and all the rest. But in the story that Luke presents to us, there was a guy called Simon, who was also a Pharisee, who invited Jesus as the, at the meal, and then an unnamed woman, uh, who was uninvited, makes an entrance. And so this woman that joins the meal, um, a woman in that town that had a reputation, we know that she lived a sinful life, uh, that's what the scriptures say. It doesn't say what sins she had, although a strong case could be made towards her being a prostitute, as those would be one of the sins everyone in the town would know you for. Um, it doesn't say she was a prostitute. Tradition says that. But she was known for having a sinful way of living. And the host, the Pharisee, knew also of her sinful life. And after the event where the woman in verse 38 cries and washes Jesus' feet, we've got in verse 39 where this man seems rather concerned, you know, this Pharisee. Um, perhaps he was really concerned about Jesus' cleanliness and how he would be made unclean by this sinful woman's touch. Or perhaps he was happy in case he was testing Jesus that, in fact, he was really not a prophet and now he's got evidence for that we don't know. But it was at that point that Jesus turns around and surprises us with yet another lovely parable. As a response, although the Pharisee wasn't talking to Jesus, but to himself. And it's a really good parable like all of Jesus' parables. And he starts talking about two people that owe the money. One of them, 500 denarii. And you get from the Bible notes that one denarius was a day's equivalent to a day's wage. So around a year and a half. Um, that was owing to, to this guy, then um, in, in our money today is a lot of money. Uh, one year's minimum wage would be around, I don't know, 16, 17, say 20,000 pounds a year, um, take home more or less. So imagine owning someone 30,000 pounds and then they just forgive your debt, you know. And then someone else was forgiven less, about 10 times less. And you need to notice before we go any further that Jesus doesn't say that the money lender, which is God, because this is a God and sinner sort of parable and amount of sin forgiven reference. Um, it doesn't say that the money lender loved or favored one of those more than the other. But then Jesus asks now who was more grateful, putting it into the biblical text. You Pharisee who thinks you've got it all sorted, you're so perfect because you keep yourself pure and don't do anything wrong, or at least you think you do so? Or this sinful woman who has done many sins, perhaps ten times more than you, and now look at her, how she cries and weeps and shows her gratitude and is forgiven because of her faith. One thing that Jesus doesn't say is that God loved one or the other more. He did the same thing for both. He forgave their debt. And the fact that one had more debt than the other and the level of their gratitude was different is just another matter. So please remember this point, that God sees us all regardless of the amount of debt that we owe Him. He sees us all the same and He gave us the same level of forgiveness. He gives us all the same opportunity to follow Christ. And I know that all of you in this room today, this is not to offend anyone, but you all have done some pretty bad stuff in your lives, in your past. This is a fact. I know that I myself have done some pretty bad stuff in my life that does not honor the Lord. But you need to know today also that God, once you ask for His forgiveness, He doesn't hold you accountable 
for your sins anymore. That's why Christ died on the cross for. You know who does? You do, and the devil does. Because there are some things that some of us do that we can't get over, we can't ever forgive ourselves, maybe for the rest of our lives, and we keep regretting them. And there are some things that the devil keeps using to attack us and to say to us, oh, you see, you're not better than before, you've never changed. And you need to know today that that's a lie from the father of lies, the devil. And you need to know that your real father, your heavenly father, already has forgiven you when you asked for his forgiveness through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so the difference is, as we see in the passage, not that God loves us differently, equivalent to the number of sins that he has forgiven us, but the difference should be in the witness that we bring forth after our forgiveness has happened. Some people act just like the Pharisee in the story, and they think of themselves so much better than others. Maybe because they think that in the eyes of God, they are seen better compared to someone that walks through the door and their life's not sorted out. They don't have the successful business and their clothes are ragged and they don't even have a car, so they walk everywhere. Or they're louder than they are, they're poorer, they're so much different than themselves. And the Pharisee says, if he was a prophet, he would know what type of woman that is, so much lower than myself, that she is a sinner. You would disregard her. You wouldn't even allow her to come close to you. She's so much worse than I am, Jesus. I am worthy, and she's not. And for the context of things, something to be noted is that the Pharisees were known for believing in salvation by segregation. That's the word of the day, in case you didn't know it. Which means salvation by keeping themselves away from anything or anyone that was sinful or unclean, anyone like the sinful woman. Some of you already know um, what the Pharisees were and how the same this guy would pray in the temple regularly. He would live a righteous life and do all the things. He was a very religious guy. He was tithing and all sorts. He would be one of those that had a reputation and people would recognize him on the streets for the right reasons. And what a contrast that is from the sinful woman. And I was wondering, when I came across this, I was thinking of this. I am 100% sure that this guy, although he was a Pharisee, was definitely not perfect. Not a saint. He had sin in his life as well. The Bible is clear on that. That we all have sinned and fallen short compared to God's standards. So even one sin if you commit, one law if you break, and still keep the rest, is still not good enough for God. The difference was that this woman's sin, whatever it might have been, was known. Everybody knew about it. The Pharisee and the whole town, village probably, the author, Luke, knew about it. And so I was wondering if sometimes maybe we do the same. We think of ourselves maybe as being better because our sin is hidden, but other people's sins and struggles are more out on the open, more on display. You see, the Pharisee, and in today's context, we find ourselves surrounded by people like that and religious people that go to church every Sunday, and they think they're so much better than someone that doesn't because they think that's what it means to worship Jesus. So they and the church have a reputation for judging other people and seeing someone speck of dust in their eyes without taking the plank out of their own eye first. But thankfully, we serve a God that doesn't judge people or love people the same as humans do or compares people to some level of standard that humans compare to. But unfortunately, not so many understand that. You see, God knows your inmost being, and God knows every single sinful thought that you and I have. And if that's not scary and doesn't call people to repentance and prayer, I don't know what is. I wonder if that would be you on display, if your sin would be on display. Would you be happy to be judged constantly because maybe you struggle with something or that you keep falling and failing and drinking more than you should and consuming substances that you know you shouldn't. 
Or you have a gambling addiction, and then you become homeless because you lose everything. Or you're going back to watching stuff that you're not supposed to watch in your spare time. Saying stuff you're not supposed to say. Doing stuff you're not supposed to do. Or would you be happier if you had people around you that would show you the same love and compassion that Jesus showed? Because to me, this is what church and what Christianity is meant to be like. Christ-like. Now, don't get me wrong, it doesn't give the churches the right to fall into sin and be affirming of all sorts of sins that are going around in the world, but it also doesn't give them the right to hate or judge anyone because of their struggle. And this is serious stuff, and if this is you today, if you ever struggle with ever thinking that you're better than anyone based on anything you can possibly think of, if you think in any way and if you consider yourself superior compared to anyone, I want to encourage you to come to talk to me but also to encourage you to ask for God for His forgiveness. You would ask God to search your soul and your heart and to see if you really think the same as the Pharisee thinks sometimes. When he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what type of woman that is that's touching him, that she's a sinner. You see, I want us all to know today whether we want to accept her or not that the only difference there is between you and an unsaved person is just that, salvation. Someone once said, remember, the unsaved person, that was you before knowing Christ. You see, God sees us all as equal, and after understanding that, hopefully comes this. That Jesus goes on and saying, do you see this woman? You know, there's seeing and there's seeing, right? This beautiful picture where Jesus looks at the woman but talks to Simon, the Pharisee. He says, Simon, do you really see her? The real her, the human her, the one that God has created in his image, do you see her? Ask yourself this today. Do I see people or do I just see something else that I shouldn't even be looking at? You know, there's a homeless guy that occasionally comes and sits at the bus station at the co-op. And I saw him twice ever since I came here. Once because someone from church told me about him. The second time because I was just passing by. I'm not going to tell you what I did. This is not about me. But those of you that are local, maybe someone told you about him. Maybe they didn't. But if they did, you know, did you go and see him? There are quite a few people, young and old, that came past when I was talking to him, not from this church, but there were quite a few number of people that came. Some of them waited in the bus station. Not one of them acknowledged him. A couple of people did, but the rest of them just passed on due to their own reasons. I'll never know. But if you pass him or someone like that, I feel Jesus asking us today, do you see them? Do you see the person Or maybe do you start judging instead of seeing? This is applicable to all sorts of people, not just the homeless guy, but you get the drift. Do you see people? When we look around us, even in church, some of us are weirder, like myself. I talk loud. I really laugh hard when something's really funny, right? You all know me. I'm loud mainly because I'm Romanian. Secondly, because I'm poor, so a lot of people say the poorer you are, the louder you get, but we're not going to get into that. But some people give me funny looks, you know, even in church, it happened before. I've seen it, but it's fine. I really don't care. What I really care about is, do we do the same to others as well? Because that's when it becomes a bigger problem. When we look at each other, do we see each other? Jesus comes and says, I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. You know, this was the custom, right? That Simon the Pharisee would do all these things as a welcome. That's why Jesus mentions them. He would give Jesus a bowl to wash his feet and a towel, perhaps kiss Jesus on the cheeks as the custom was. 
Instead, this woman provided all of that out of her love when she didn't even have to. She was not the host, but a simple guest. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has forgiven, has been forgiven little, loves little. Now, if you don't know God's forgiveness in your life yet, if you don't follow Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, this story is for you as well. And the implication is that no matter how you see yourself, no matter how others see you, no matter what horrible sins you've done in your life and how sinful and horrible you see yourself, God has a different view of you. No matter who you are and where you are, whether you're saved or not, God sees you differently and He sees your heart. God doesn't just see the righteous religious people that think they're so much better than the others. God sees you and He wants a relationship with you so you can come to Him by faith today because God wants to forgive you of your many sins and to be able to tell you as well, go, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Go, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. As we think of this passage and whether, you know, whatever God may speak to you through it, I want to challenge you on this. Who are you more like? Are you more like the woman who understands the severity of all the sins that she has done and all the sins that she kept doing and then God forgives her? And then she lives a life of worship as a result of the transformation because of the debt forgiven. Or the Pharisee who doesn't see beyond the sin of the woman and judges and thinks he's better than her. The Pharisee was religious, as some of us are. And I'm the best example for that. I used to be so religious in the Orthodox Church. But I was not walking with Christ. You can be so religious no matter what age you have and not be saved. You can be coming to church because your parents came to church all their life but not be saved. You can be going to church, you know, and that doesn't make any difference if you're a follower of Christ or not. Billy Graham said something funny once. He said, just because you're born in a garage doesn't mean you're a car. The same, it doesn't mean if you're being brought up in the church, it doesn't mean that you're a follower of Christ. And so the Pharisee who invites Jesus in without a proper welcome, who just looks at Jesus as he's just a good teacher, some are willing to listen, but not willing to allow him to change in every aspect of their lives, including on how they see others. You need to remember this contrast, that this woman was throwing herself literally at the feet of Jesus because of who he is. I've got to be honest with you, I've been struggling with this passage so much over this past week, or two, or three, or ever since I knew I'm going to be doing it, because I know that as time goes by, there are fewer moments where I throw myself down on the floor in my bedroom at the feet of Jesus like that. There are fewer and fewer moments. It doesn't mean we don't pray, it doesn't mean we don't spend time with God, but that acknowledgement that He saved us from the fire of hell, how many times do we do that? When was the last time that you maybe did that? For the Pharisee, Jesus was never more than a house guest whom he didn't even welcome properly, let alone worship him. I want to leave you with these three things today. Number one, the way that you view others based on us being saved and then not being saved, our sins being hidden and their sins being more on display needs to change. Why? Because God's view of our humanity is not the way that we view people. And God just might surprise you the way that he did with the story of Jesus' view over this woman. Number two, our view of ourselves needs to change as well. Because someone said to me once some while ago, if you don't love and forgive yourself, how do you think you can love and forgive others? You see, your past does not define you. Your sins do not define you. The moment you stepped over that fence and you started to live a life with Christ, sin has no more power over you as it doesn't have any more power over Jesus. And you need to start seeing yourself more the way that your heavenly Father sees you. Not how people see you, 
even the members of your family at times, you are more than that. And you are worth more than that. And your true worth is in the way that Jesus sees you. And number three, if you're here today or watching us at any time, and if you find yourself in the sinful woman of this story, and if anyone in a church has ever hurt you so badly or looked down at you because of that, instead of showing you God's love, all I can say is on behalf of my brothers and sisters, sorry that you have been mistreated. A behavior like this is unacceptable and is not Christ-like, no matter what argument someone would bring. And you need to know today as well that God loves you and God sees you and that through Jesus you can find that peace and comfort that you need by coming to Him and acknowledging your sins before Him and asking for His forgiveness in faith. He died for you as well and He sees you differently than anyone here on earth will ever see you. So come today to Him in faith so that you as well could experience the same comforting words that Jesus said to the woman. Go, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching with Church Baptist Church YouTube. If you're new to our channel, why not subscribe? That way you can know when we post new content. Make sure you leave us a comment. Let us know how we can pray for you, what spoke to you today, and where you're writing from. And also share these messages with one of your friends if you find them encouraging and inspiring in any way. Hey, listen, if you're able to, why not join us in one of our services at our physical location? All our details are on the website. I'll see you there. God bless you.